graphic nature of this program, listener discretion is advised. Hey man, this is Kevin Smith, guy who makes all those unlistenable podcasts over at Smodcast.com, and you're listening to the Two Strangers One Podcast. This is podcasting. Your Skype call is being recorded. Your life is being recorded. There's nowhere you can run. There's nowhere you can hide. You're listening to Two Strangers One Podcast. Well, hello and welcome to Two Strangers One Podcast. I'm Chris. I'm Paul. And we apologize for the long, long uh, lapse in between the episodes. Um, real it's life happens. Fault. And it's Chris's fault. Yeah, it's all my fault, Paul. <laughs> you're not going through your own fucking drama. It's totally just me. I don't know what you're no. talking about. I would never be going through drama. Well, we're both going through drama, I guess would be the best way to put it. But, um, you know, I was, I'm was i in a much better mood than I was about this time last week. Um, I was kind of <laughs> going through. Are. Yeah, I was going through a lot of drama with uh, my baby mama and my daughter. Um, but wouldn't you know it, you know, I file for custody of my daughter. And magically, about a week before I go to court, um, there's an accusation that I hit my daughter in the stomach. And now, mind you, the way the story goes is my daughter told her brother or her half brother or whatever that I hit her in the stomach. And then the, the half brother went and told the grandfather who then called Child Protective Services. So, right. so, so let's get this straight. A three year old told her 10 year old brother and I'm pretty I'm not that she doesn't have a bad relationship with her brother I'm saying is you know and then he said you know so she said that he said that everybody said and basically it comes down to to, to making me like I'm look like I'm some sort of monster like I hit my daughter um, and I, obviously this this uh, accusation comes about a week before we go to court for uh, you know me us going for I'm trying to get custody of my daughter at least partial custody you know and of course in the paperwork they go you know what are you seeking so I put full custody knowing full well that in no way shape or form you know I'm not that gullible to think that you know they're gonna give me full custody I know they're not gonna go hey sure go ahead have your kid you know, and it's, I know it's going to be a joint custody thing, but, you know, you have to shoot high. You know what I'm saying? Like, when you're doing any kind of negotiations, like on a contract or something like that, you always ask for more. So then when they when they kick it back, you know, you're like, oh, okay, I'll take 50%, you know, whatever. You know, so uh, it's just, it was, it's just in a real fucked up situation. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm like a goofy dad. I mean, anybody who's, anybody who listens to the show and is friends with me on Facebook knows that like, you know, I'm a goofy dad. All I do is take pictures of my daughter, you know, saying like, you know, I, I, I'm so proud of her. And unfortunately, since I do live 300 miles away from the rest of my family, you know, I post pictures on Facebook a lot because, you know, my, unfortunately with the situation being the way it is, I'm with my daughter all the way up here, you know, so far from home that, you know, my family isn't getting a chance to see my daughter not in person so i mean that's why you know i mean i know i'm one of those like obnoxious people like you know people post pictures of their kids all the time like oh come on get over it but i know like that you know i post a lot of pictures of my daughter because she, unfortunately her her family her biological father's side of the family doesn't get a chance to see her so you know i do post a lot of pictures of her i'm a goofy dad i'm one you know i'm a sucker i you know I'm, I'm i'm one of those guys you know she has me wrapped around her little finger you know, she's going to be one of, you know, she's going to be like nine years old saying I want a pony and I'm going to be the one, you know, busting my fucking back to get her one or something like that. I mean, if I get a better job, I guess. But, uh, you know, what I'm saying like for anyone, if anyone was to believe that I would lay a hand on my daughter in anger is fucking is ridiculous. You know, and it's, it's it, is obvious, it is obviously I mean, I don't want to I don't want to point fingers and say that I'm being set up or anything like that, but. You know, it's it's just has a, a wonderfully convenient, uh, you know, comes up about a week before we go to court. And then we went to court. And uh, so what had happened was I, I was given the opportunity before all this. I was able to pick up my daughter from daycare. 
um, go out with her, take her places, or we go back to my house. And then as long as I had her back at daycare before the grandfather picked her up, that was the old arrangement. Well, now, you know, the grandfather saying that if I hit my daughter, uh, that now um, I can't see her. I can't see her at all unless it's supervised, meaning that I can only see her if I go to the if I go to the daycare. Right. Get this. I, so so I go to it really yeah. is. So I have to go to the daycare. Like, like I'm allowed to visit her at the daycare, which meaning that, you know, there's 20 other kids running around a room. There's, you know, uh, the other, you know, the, the women that work there, you know. And so, like, I'm kind of like a third person in the room. I mean, even though the way the building is set up, there's other there's other like daycares there, like different age groups. So but of my daughter's age group, there's about 20 kids there. You know, and I'm like, you know, and then like my, you know, I, I really can't give my daughter the attention I want to give her, you know, and, you know, she's easily distracted, you know, because there's all this other stuff going on. So that kind of sucks. Um, but I guess like in the past couple of days, like I said, I am in a much better mood because like the arrangement we have now or not the arrangement, but, you know, like, you know, the grandfather says he wants somebody monitoring the visits. So, who you know, to monitor the visits, it would be my daughter's mother, you know, which puts me in a fucking real fucking, you know, paints me in a corner because, you know, I have to be careful of what I do or what I say or, you know what I'm saying? Because I am totally at their mercy, you know what I'm saying? Because technically the grandfather has custody, but he's, you know, he with him having custody on paper, the way it looks, he's giving the mother uh, the right to be the person supervising our visit. The mother who I've had a tumultuous relationship with. <laughs> you know, saying, you know. <laughs> no, 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 no. An interesting relationship. It was interesting. I mean, you know, I mean, anyone who listens to this show or whatever, I mean, I've never really, I've never really, uh, you know, hid the fact that, you know, we had a very, um, you know, uh, I don't know. I don't want to worry, you know. You know, some people, like I said, there, some people would paint the picture domestic violence. You know, it's, yeah, domestic violence as in two people who fight, you know, not domestic. When you say domestic violence, it kind of paints a picture of a guy that just hits the woman. Um, yeah. This is, these are, we were hitting each other. You know what I'm saying? I mean, she initiated, she probably initiated more of the, of the, of the hands than I ever did. You know, and just unfortunately, since I'm the bigger, stronger person, you know, I usually ended the fight. So that made me look like the bad guy. And of course, you know, it's 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 very easy to point a finger at me and say, oh, you're a bad guy. How dare you put your fucking hands on a woman and you're a piece of shit. But, you know, I've I've I was also I also came from a place where, you know, someone puts their hands on you. You've just opened the floodgates for me to put my hands back. You know, saying if you put my if you put your hands on me, you've just opened the floodgates to put my hands on you. Nobody's above a good ass whooping. You know what I'm saying? And it's I'm not saying that good that i whipped their ass or anything like that you know uh and we probably i probably we've probably lost all our female listeners but, um, <laughs> <laughs> yep, i'm just saying it was, a, it was a very very hostile uh relationship i mean you know and obviously isn't this is not a normal thing it's not a usual thing and of course it's not good to have a, a, an environment where kids are being raised where the parents put their hands on each other and so you know but since then you know i've moved out of the house you know right. i've been i've been living in my own place i mean you know this podcast you know goes back two years i was still living with my daughter when this podcast started i mean this this podcast has kind of been documenting my whole uh, journey you know and i've moved like three or four times last year you know luckily i've been at the same place for almost you know a little more than half a year now you know i've been working for almost a year now you know i've, I've i'm getting myself stable i'm getting myself you know, and, and I do stuff like this. I do stuff like the podcast to stay positive, to stay, to do something constructive, to have something to look forward to. Because unfortunately, I'm not here living with my daughter. You know what I'm saying? As much as I love this podcast, I mean, I would probably, we still record this podcast at night. I mean, if we were doing this podcast, uh, you know, like if my, if I did have custody of my daughter, she would be sleeping right now. You know what I'm saying? We'd be, we'd be recording this while she's, while, you know, she's, you know, cause we always rec yeah. re record at night anyway. So she's, you know, she would be in bed by now by the time we do our podcast. We don't even like, gets to start recording till about 11 o'clock at night <laughs> right so, um you know so that you know and, and you know and i don't drink you know i've said this a million times i don't drink i don't do drugs you know i'm trying to do something positive you know what i'm saying i mean you know yes we do focus on corny comic book movies and video games and stupid shit like that if you want to call it stupid shit but i think it's positive you know i think it's it's it keeps you know for, for the lack of a better term it's keeping me out of trouble you know <laughs> yeah it's like i sound like the, the kids that like you know, please, uh, you know, uh, buy my candy bars so I don't roam the streets. You know, <laughs> please listen to my co my podcast. It keeps me from roaming the streets, which you know, it gives it gives me something constructive to do. And I, you know, I love doing the podcast. You know, for all intents and purposes, it is a job. 
you know, you, you do have to be up on, you know, uh, trying to get new listeners, you know, getting the episodes up, producing the episodes, you know, looking up stuff to talk about for the episodes. You know, it, it, is, it is a good way for me to spend my time. You know, would I like to right. be, would I like to be spending time with my daughter? Absolutely. But for the time being, I can't. And it really, really sucks. And that's kind of like the drama that's been going on in my life. And, you know, and I apologize. And, and, and once again, <laughs> we've gotten, I've gotten two angry emails from our buddy Oscar from South America uh, wondering where the hell we are. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> and so, you know, and, and Paul and I, I mean, you know, I mean, yeah, it's called Two Strangers on Podcast. I mean, we do. I mean, actually, it was it was totally by coincidence. I happened to be we happened to run into each other out in the street when I was out with my my daughter and her mother. Um, you know, you you would happen to walk by. We were we were, you know, me and my we were at a playground. And uh, and, and, and I was like, that's Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Because we generally we don't really hang out, but uh, you know, it's it all your kind of, <laughs> It's like that's fucking Paul right there, you know. And then you thought you thought that my baby mama was giving you dirty looks, and then she after you left, she thought she, no, what? Did, yeah, you thought yeah, she yeah, giving you dirty exactly looks. Thought, yeah. She told me that she thought I, that you were giving her dirty looks, and then but of course she goes, yeah, you. She goes like this. She goes, uh, you probably told him everything about me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, he did, but <laughs> <laughs> well, like I, I can't, I, I don't think I could ever tell anyone everything about her because there's shit that even I will keep to myself, so I'll take to the grave. But you know, right? Uh, you know, but she, I guess she was under the impression that, like, you know, and and don't get me wrong, it's not like I paint her with this wonderful brush. I mean, you know, she is someone that, like I said, I've had very hostile relations with. You know what I'm saying? But then again, she's also the mother of my do- uh, mother of my kid, my one and only child. You know, so you know. Um, unfortunately for the next, you know, 14 years, because my daughter turns four in a couple of weeks, you know, uh, we're going to have to deal with each other, you know, and I, and, and, you know, it's one of those deals where, you know, I just have to deal with it. I mean, I know as my daughter gets older, you know, kids love their parents, no matter how flawed they are. And, and not that I'm Mr. Perfect. I'm, I'm very fucking flawed. Um, you know, my daughter's going to love me. My daughter's going to love her mother. And, you know, we just have to fucking work towards having some sort of fucking harmony, some sort of, uh, you know. And like I said, I mean, you know, was I really fucking down in the dumps last week when, you know, I thought I wasn't going to have a chance to see my daughter at all? Yeah, I was I was really fucking depressed. I was really fucking torn up, man. And um oh, I know. imagine I, I really imagine. I mean that dude like if if my baby's mom, who I don't really talk about, if my baby's mom ever sat there and said to me, you know, you have to have supersized visits with your kid and everything, I would I would literally flip out. Yeah. It's hard, man. Right. Because I am I am at their mercy. I am I am so fucking you know and and you know men men and i was watching this documentary which coincidentally was from england um because in england uh they have a they have a organization called justice for fathers and i don't know if you remember there was like an incident about maybe about two years ago where there was like a guy like one guy dressed up like spider-man and he climbed like he climbed like the size side of a building yes and and then there was like another guy dressed up like batman and i think he was along with him or something like that and they did like some sort of publicity stunt and yeah, it sounds corny and ridiculous or whatever, but they were doing it to bring attention to the group Justice for Fathers. And, you know, and it's, you know, for all the people that say, oh, we live in a male dominated society, which I guess is is true. We do live in a male dominated society. I mean, the courts really do side on the, the mothers. They really do take the mother's side. And men, unfortunately, get get the short end of the stick, you know, when it comes to, you know, um, you know, you're guilty until proven innocent. You know, this situation where I'm being accused of hitting my daughter in the stomach, like on paper, it just, you're automatically guilty. You know, you're automatically like, you know, there's no common sense. There's no, um, there's no like third person that's truly neutral to look at it because, you know, and I I hate to put it, I hate to, I hate to put it in these terms, but you know, you go to court and the judge is a woman and, you know, the lawyer, uh, you know, uh, the, the, you know, the lawyer, the my, the lawyer representing my daughter's mother is a woman and and in family court they hire they have a whole third party uh, lawyer that represents the kids she's a woman the person who works for child protective services that comes to do the investigation there's another woman and i'm not trying to make it sound like oh you know you know know, men versus women deal but you know there's all these women 
and you know and i want to i want to be judged fairly i want to be judged you know uh, it's bad enough i'm being judged i want to be judged fairly and i don't feel like i'm getting no it, it, see, i don't feel like i'm getting a fair share i don't well, feel like it's a fair deal as you know like i've gone through this shit before and mm. what you have to understand is is Basically, here's the, here's the thing. You walk into court, and the idea is, okay, you're 50-50. Here's the problem. Um, 90% of the time, they side with the, the female. Sometimes you get lucky, and you get a judge that sides with males. But that never really happens. So, um, my thing is, is like, they... It, it basically, it, it, I guess the best way to say it is, unless the unless the mother does something really fucked up, you're not going to get your kid. You know what I mean? Like, obviously, in your situation is different, obviously, but because yeah, it, because the grandfather has custody, right? And you guys are kind of you guys are kind of a couch potato. You know what I'm saying? He's never going to get right. in trouble because he doesn't. You know what I'm saying? He barely moves from his fucking seat. Well, you know what, I, what I'm saying to you, what I'm saying though, is like you guys, you and your ex are kind of on the same level right now. So it could go either way, but you know, usually when you walk into court, it's the female that's going to get the kid no matter what. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've been there; I've done that. You know, like I have, we have, um, what's the, we have like joint custody, mm-hmm. where but she has custodial rights, but she has to technically tell me everything, and she can't take my kid out of the state without my permission. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and that's unfortunately, I mean, that's that's uh, one of the things recently where like I have gotten. Like, I'm supposed to be notified when my daughter goes to doctor's visits. I haven't been notified. You're going to tell me in a year and a half my daughter hasn't been to the doctor once, you know, which, True. which you know, and if that is the case, if she hasn't been to the doctor, what the fuck, you know what I'm saying? She's supposed to, you know, at this age, you know, I think you go like every, once every six months. Um, then, uh, you know, so I haven't, I haven't been, I haven't been privy to any of her doctor's visits, you know, and, you know, now she's four and she's, you know, I mean, you know, we got preschool right around the corner. You know, and they're supposed to they're supposed to be talking to me about it. Mm-hmm. And no, there's been no discussion whatsoever with me on what's going on with preschool, you know, and, and it's just it's it's very, very frustrating because, you know, I don't have a leg to stand on. And if I get angry now, all of a sudden, I'm the bad guy. Right. Saying I'm the and hostile to, one. And to be honest with you, dude, it's just better just to right now, just be the good guy, do everything that's asked of you and just do it that way until, you know, you get your day in court. And then once you get your day in court, you'll be like. Guess what? I'm gonna see my daughter on these days, and that's it. Yeah. You know what? And that's the way it's gonna have to be, unfortunately. But you know. Yeah, and and, yeah. and and let me just, of course, you know, there's there's his story, her story, and then there's the truth. Well, I'm gonna give you my story. Okay, so um, you know, and I've I've made this I've made this perfectly clear in the past that you know my my daughter's mother um, has had or or still suffers from a chemical chemical abuse chemical addiction abuse, whether it be hard drugs uh, or alcohol or a combination of the both. And when I say hard drugs, I mean crack cocaine, heroin, um, you know, and it, it, it hurts me to say this, but, you know, she was getting high when my daughter was in her stomach. She was smoking crack and doing heroin when she was pregnant. Right. And I think the one of the saving graces for my daughter was the fact that the mother went to jail during the last trimester mm-hmm. of, of, of the pregnancy. Luckily, she got out of jail about three weeks before my daughter was born. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the, the last, you know, the last few months of her pregnancy, you know, except for like the last three weeks right before she had the kid, she was in jail. So she was f- kind of forced to clean up. And of course, you know, you know, there's stories, you know, you, you, you could still get drugs in jail. But for the most part, she was she was clean. So I had I had called Child Protective Services back then. Right. I called Child Protective Services and I said, look, you know. She's getting high and she has a kid inside her. And they said, oh, we don't, uh, we don't, uh, if it's a fetus, it doesn't count. We don't, we don't get involved until the child is born. Wait, what? Yeah. That's stupid. There is, or at least in New York, there, there is nothing in the, on the books that is so about, a, about a mother that gets high. I'm a little pissed about that now. Yeah. It's, that it's is, really, that, that, it's really fucking sad. It really that is. really sad, man. I'm pissed about that. No, no, they should be. The minute that something happens, you they should be on top of that shit. Doesn't matter if the kid's born or not. If they're if it's clear that this woman's pregnant, and she's more than how old how how long was she pregnant? At at this point, I mean, like I said, the last trimester. So she she was at least four to five months pregnant. Right. 
crack and heroin, bro. Okay. Uh, you so, know, yeah, yeah. Once again, you can you can look at this story and say, "Oh, Chris, we're only getting your side of the story." Well, I mean, take it, or, take it or leave it. Why would I lie about something like that? Why would I? Why would I make something like that up? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, I may have written yeah. novels, but even I can't make shit like that up. You know. Um. So, all right. So, so then um, my, my my daughter was born. And um, luckily, you know, I mean, my my daughter was born with a hole in her lung. And trust me, I spoke to the doctors about this, all this. But they said that was basically through just um, the trauma of childbirth. Because my, my daughter had a teeny tiny microscopic hole that was slowly leaking air into the sac around the lung. And they, they, they took her out here. It's a you know, strong hospital, you know, that strong memorial hospital, which is like, you know, has like the best um, uh, pediatric unit. You know, and and because we had had our daughter at a different hospital, so imagine you're there with your baby, and they rushed my daughter from the hospital in like her own ambulance. These strangers, your your ch- my child is not even twenty four year twenty four hours old, um, is being rushed to Strong when you know what I'm saying like the the trauma of watching your child, watching these people come and take your kid, and put it in this little like. Uh, it was like almost like an incubate, incubator box or whatever. I mean, my daughter was, I mean, the, the mother came to term as in like my daughter probably came two weeks earlier than projected. She wasn't premature or anything like that. Um, but that's traumatizing for them to take your baby away from you less than 24 hours, year old, 24 hours old to the hospital. So, you know, we transferred over to Strong and my daughter was in, my daughter was in the NICU, the, the neo-infant uh, something unit uh, for three weeks. You know, the first three weeks she was in this intensive care unit. Yeah, the neonatal intensive care unit, the NICU in Strong Memorial Hospital. Wonderful people, um, very, very professional. I mean, you know, uh, you know, like even when you walk in, there's like a little area where you have to stop and wash your own hands and stuff like that. Right. Like you, you're not a, you can't just walk into this unit. You have to be screened and you're only allowed like two different people at a time and you have to be like immediate family. It was a very, very, you know, intense three weeks. But, but the doctors, the doctors assured me because of course, you know, I brought it up to them. I said, look, you know, the mom was doing drugs and they said, no, 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 this is something that's relatively relatively common you know you know it had nothing to do with the drugs or whatever you know so you know so we do that and i would say probably about a month after my daughter was born i called child protective services again because the mom had disappeared um you know she was known for for going on drunk drug binges which basically you know like she'd be clean for a little while then she'd go get high for a couple of days straight you know where she'd be incommunicado had no idea where the fuck she was or what she was doing and then she'd come home and she would come home one day and she was, you know, all fucked up. And she was, you know, she, she came to the house with like a fucking bottle of vodka. And, you know, and once again, you know, you can sit here and say, yeah, Chris, you know, you're bullshitting. I, there, I have no reasons to lie about this. So um, I, I call Child Protective Services. OK, my daughter's born. My daughter's a month old. She's an actual person, not a fetus. You know, so I got the ball rolling with Child Protective Services. So. Of course, you know, they fucking drag their feet and nothing gets taken care of. A um, couple of months later, I would say, about seven months later, um, the mom had gone on one of her drug binges um, and, you know, calls me like at 11 o'clock at night. Oh, could you come get me? You know, and you have to understand at this time, you know, when things were, I don't want to say better in a relationship because things were never really great. But, you know, being a guy and guys always have this fucking white knight complex that we're going to fucking be a hero and save the day. Right. I, I say, OK, I'm going to go pick you up. I have my daughter in the car. It's 11 o'clock at night. And once, you know, and I've said I've said this a million times to people, you know, I'm from New York City. No ghetto in Rochester puts any fucking fear in my heart. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I've lived in the South right. Bronx. I've lived in East New York, Brooklyn. You know, I've lived in some of the worst fucking neighborhoods. You know, uh, the ghettos of Rochester are a fucking child's play to me. Um, so I had my daughter in the car and I didn't know this, but I guess the police were, the police were kind of staking this place out. And so when the, when my daughter's mother gets into the car, I, as I'm driving on my way home, they had followed me a couple blocks, pulled me over. Uh, you know, they searched the car, they searched me because apparently this cop had arrested my daughter's mother in the past. And this guy was a real fucking prick. He had, and he had said, oh, why can't you keep your bitch in line? Can you believe what the fuck? I swear to wow. God, that's a line he told me. Why can't you keep your bitch in line? Because he, he's, he's, he's arrested her in the past. And I would love to give out his name, but I don't want to fucking you know, deal with that nonsense. No, you don't want to deal with that shit, man. 
So, you know, and, and dude, this particular officer was the canine officer here in Rochester. They had the fucking dog sniffing my car. So obviously I was doing any drugs. I was never, drugs were never my thing. At that particular time I was drinking, but not, I wasn't drinking that night. Um, so they let me go. This guy files a fucking report, like literally five days later, cause I had gotten a ticket or whatever. And, um, so the report comes out five days later. Um, another week or so after that, um, my daughter's mother has a, a OBGYN appointment to go see her gynecologist because we were seeing, you know, during the course of the pregnancy, she was keeping her regular OBGYN appointments. I mean, I, I made my damnness to make sure she made it to these appointments. And that OBGYN was the closest thing she had to a, you know, a, a, a you know, main healthcare professional, you know, saying like she had no regular doctor except for her OBGYN. So, of course, probably 45 minutes before we go to the doctor's appointment, she shoots up some heroin. You know what I'm saying? Because it was one of those deals where like she would, she, now mind you, at the time she wasn't doing this in the house or anything like that, but she would shoot up and then she'd call me to come pick her up. You know what I'm saying? So I pick her up. I take her to the OBGYN appointment. She is nodding out. You know, if you know, people who do heroin, you know, it's almost, it looks like they're falling asleep, like their heads start to slump and shit like that. And so now mind you, my daughter's there with me, totally clean, totally sober, all, you know, I have all my facilities, but the mother is nodding out like in the waiting room at the OBGYN's uh, uh, you know, office. So I guess they're obligated to report shit like that. You know, so that combined with the doctors, uh, that combined with being pulled over like a week before that, um, that's how I initially lost. I lost custody of my daughter. That was the um, situation that caused me to to lose custody of my daughter. My daughter went to, went into foster care for a couple of months. You know, I mean, I was allowed to visit luckily, luckily, because you hear fucking horror stories about the foster care system. Luckily, my daughter, uh, went to a wonderful family's house. I'm still, I'm still in contact with the people who were her foster parents for all intents and purposes. They are her godparents, wonderful, wonderful people. And they're the type of people, you know, I sit there and I may talk shit about like Bible thumpers and, you know, religious people, but these are the kind of people that they're not judgmental. They're not, you know, they don't force their religion on anybody's throats. You know, they live the way they feel you're supposed to live. And, you know, saying they live it. They're not like, fuck, they're not hypocrites. They're wonderful people. So, um, you know, so then long story short, my daughter, my daughter gets to come back home because her grandfather is 100% Seneca Indian and, uh, people of Native American descent are, are, um, they're held to, they're held, it's, it's, they're held to like a different standard. Like Native Americans, like if you have, if you take a, a Native American child into custody, you have to do everything in your power to stick them with a Native American family. Right. Because us, us wonderful Americans have been so wonderful to the Native Americans. So, um, you know, there were, there was worries and there was fears that my daughter might have end up, go, have, end up having to go to either Buffalo or Syracuse because there were no Native American families here in Rochester. Um, that were on the foster foster parent list. So the grandfather steps up and says, you know, okay, I'm 100% Seneca. Um, I'll take my daughter. I'll take my granddaughter. So boom, the granddaughter comes home because we were at the time living with my daughter's mother's father, you know, so we're there and we, you know, and everything is what it is, you know, and I'm taking care of my daughter. And that's around the time I started this podcast, you know, and I was, I lost my job at Radio Shack because those scumbags, you know, are all about trying to fucking make money and not about, uh, you know, the, the scumbags are all about, you know, uh, trying to make cell phone sales and fuck everything else. Um, so I had, I had lost my job working for Radio Shack. And so I was unemployed. But the reason I was unemployed is because I'm there raising my daughter. I wasn't unemployed because I'm sitting around scratching my balls, you know, playing fucking video games. I'm, ta I'm raising my daughter. Even though the grandfather has custody, I'm raising my daughter. And the mother, unfortunately, is back in and out, in and out, getting high, doing whatever she's doing. So, you know, this leads to the story, you know, of, of, I'm pretty sure everyone's heard it before, where, you know, the mom brought the boyfriend over to the house. You know, the mom gets a new boyfriend. You know, new guy, a fucking mechanic, you know, mechanics rip people off, you know, and he, he's using all that money to fund her habit. You know, so the first day she brings him to the house, you know, I had given him a warning. I said, don't come back to this house. Don't I don't want you here. You're not invited here, you know. But I guess since I shared since I shared the rent with the grandfather, he was a guest of the grandfather. Well, the second time the guy comes to the house and this is all on record and I've already I've already uh, went to court over this. The guy comes to the house. You know, I come home. His car's in the driveway. I walk upstairs. I go and I punch him dead in the fucking face. Unfortunately, my daughter was in the area. So, you know, they, they paint the picture that I'm endangering my daughter. When the first time 
I gave this guy a warning and I said, don't come to this house anymore. And I handled it civilly. The second time I lost my temper and I whooped this guy's ass. So uh, now, when, so I'm the bad guy for defending my house. So since then, you know, I've been asked to leave that house. You know, like I said, last year I moved about three or four times or whatever. And once again, I preface this all by saying, yes, there's his story, there's her story, and there's the truth. You can take it or leave it as what I'm saying. You can take it with a fucking grain of salt. You know, I'm telling you it's the fucking truth. You know, so... You know, those are all the events that have led up to me not having custody of my daughter. Now, that being said, you know, I can understand, you know, you hear horror stories about parents who beat their kids, parents who, you know, uh, torture their children, you know, scald them with hot water, um, neglect them. Parents that, you know, do go get get high and leave their kids in the house for fucking hours or days, you know, saying to fend for themselves or leave, you know, you'll, these parents who leave like a four year old with a fucking eight year old and eight year olds doing all the parenting and stuff like that. None of this was going on. Everything that I told you is 100 percent the truth but i'm the one i'm the bad guy you know so right that's 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 everything that kind of like leads up and you know and i'm not looking for sympathy i'm not looking for i'm not looking for a woe was me kind of a deal i'm i'm telling the fucking truth you know and i just kind of i kind of want to get this out there you know what i'm saying i mean it is it's a horribly embarrassing story i know like you know um you know i was raised in a very um you know straight edge household and very you know um you know uh you know, stories like this would be considered embarrassing, you know, uh, you know, stuff like that. You know, unfortunately, times have changed or whatever. And, and it's the truth. You know, I could sit here and, you know, and, you know, say, boom, this is this is my life. This is this is what's going on in my life. And so, you know, I mean, I'm not looking to bum people out. I'm not looking for sympathy. I just want to get this out there. Right. You know what I'm saying? And and of course, I don't want my daughter to get hurt with the reality. I don't want my daughter to 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 I want her to know the truth. I know it's going to hurt her. I know it's going to, um, you know, I mean, when she's mature enough and she's old enough, I, I want her to know the truth, you know, and, and let's just say I get hit by a fucking bus tomorrow. You know what I'm saying? I'm putting this out there. So, you know, someone if, if I'm not alive to tell her, someone can tell her. And I'm not saying I'm, I'm not coming going to commit suicide or anything like that. I'm just saying is, you know, I want people to know what the hell's going on in my life. You know what I'm saying? And like I said, we do we do this goofy show. Yeah, we talk about fucking comic books and video games and funny, goofy shit because reality sucks. <laughs> reality really fucking sucks. And, you know, it's, you know, I want to get lost in the fucking world of Guardians of the Galaxy. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? I want to believe in walking trees and fucking raccoons that carry bazookas because fucking reality sucks balls. It really does, you know? Well, so you think, I think <laughs> I, I I don't know what to say to all that. You went way like like over the edge on that shit. Um, <laughs> like I'm just like, I mean, you know, I'm uh, I'm here. I'm alive. My daughter's here. My daughter's alive. You know, do I think the grandfather means the best? Yes, I do think the grandfather means the best. Do I think the mother is means her best? Yes, yeah, she does mean her best. I mean, intentions and execution are two different things. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But, um, you know, I just, you know, I just, I, on paper, and on paper, I'm painted as the bad guy. And I'm not. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a victim of, you know, uh, it was it Lemony Stitch in the fucking series of unfortunate events. You know, that's, that's well, dude, my life is a series of fucking un- unfortunate events, you know? I, I guess the best thing to say, best thing to say is, dude, like, the weirdest things happen. I guess, like, you think that things are going to happen one way and they happen another. And yeah. sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. But it always comes back to being, you know, ended up working out the way that you want it to work out, you know? Yeah. I mean, and, you know, I mean, this is, don't get me wrong, this has made me, like, appreciate the relationship with my daughter. You know, people don't know, you know, you don't know what you have till it's gone kind of a deal. You know what I'm saying? I, I don't think, you know, I don't think even if, let's just say, you know, things work out and I get half custody and whatever, like I'm not going to be a regular father because I'm going to, I have, I could always look back to this time where I didn't have my daughter and I'm not there. Like, like I helped, but I wasn't there. I wasn't there to potty train my daughter. You know what I'm saying? I helped and I enforced the, I enforced the lessons that she got at daycare and stuff like that. But, you know, I'm forever, you know, when it comes to something, you know, something is basic, but very, very important to child development. I wasn't there. I wasn't allowed to be there. And, you know, and it kills me. You know what I'm saying? And once again, I'm not looking to bump people out. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just speaking my mind and speaking the truth. You know, and it, it fucking kills me that I wasn't there for my daughter for that. Right. You know? And, you know, who knows? I mean, I, I I may not have another kid. I may not, you know, that's, you know, 
You know, oh, who knows? Oh, shit, shit. One way or the other, I'm having another kid. Don't you worry about that. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, I mean, I would, I, I, I've learned, obviously, I'm going to have to meet the right person. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to take it as lightly as I had in the past if I do meet the next person and, and things get serious or whatever. But, you know, um, you know, she, this could very well be my only child. You know, the, the only person that's going to carry on my DNA. I mean, yes, I have I have two wonderful nephews, um, unfortunately, that, you know, I've had problems with my brother. So I don't even I don't I haven't even had a chance to see my nephews in years. Um, but that's that's a whole other story I'm not going to get into. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, you know, they're men. They'll carry on the cologne name. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, I mean, you know, my daughter one day may marry somebody. And if she cho- chooses to be a little more traditional, may change her name. You know what I'm saying? And then, you know, that part of me is gone, you know? Right. I mean, you know, I mean, you know, and I hate to be all fatalistic, but, you know, if I do get hit by a fucking truck tomorrow, I mean, she's all, she's, she's the only remnant right now on this earth of me, other than a bunch of fucking, <laughs> a couple hundred hours of bullshit podcasts. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, uh, right. you know, I mean, I mean, she, you know, I mean, of course, every guy kind of has, every guy, we've seen enough Mori Povich and stuff like that. We always got worried, like, is she my kid? Is she my kid? I mean, I see, I do see, I do see the resemblance, you know, saying I do see, you know, the, I see, I do see some of my features in her face. You know, I do see features, you know, she does, in my opinion, she oh, has dude, like, my your, mother's that, nose. <laughs> that's definitely your kid, dude. Like, there's no, there's no question that's definitely your kid. Like, she actually looks like you, dude, so. <laughs> no question about that, man. I can tell you that right now. Um, I don't know, man. Like, I, I guess I mean we're gonna have to move on here and go to commercial. Yeah. yeah so I mean, you know, and um, usually as we during the past bunch of episodes, which I like the first part of the episode, the first part of the episode is kind of everyday life stuff, you know. And we'll be back with the nerdy news. You know, if you've, if you've come this far into the show, you know, we're gonna get back to the fun parts. So I guess we'll be back with more dick and fart jokes. This episode of Two Strangers, One Podcast is brought to you by Comics Etc., 1115 East Main and North Goodman at the Hungerford Building, door number 8. Find out more information at comicsetc.biz or like them on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash comicsetc1. Click and Hit, enhancing the experience for all recreational smokers. Click and Hit is a one-handed portable vaporizer. This smoking pipe has a compact four-stage design, complete with a built-in, windproof, butane refillable torch lighter. The large burn chamber holds your stash of legal herb or pipe tobacco. Click the button to ignite and inhale as usual. When you are done, put it back in your pocket for later. Smoke anytime with the touch of a button. No more carrying around grinders and tins. You can leave the pipe, rolling papers, and even your lighter at home. The Click and Hit cordless vaporizer is no bigger than a normal cigar, making it the world's smallest and most discreet vaporizer. It's perfect for use in small places or shared rooms. It's efficient getting five to eight drawers from your packed chamber. It's affordable at just $19.95 each. Buy three and the shipping is free. Buy four and you get the fifth one free. Visit www.click dash the letter n dash hit.com. That's click and hit.com. And now for listeners of Two Strangers One Podcast, you can use promo code STRANGERS and receive 10% off your purchase at clickandhit.com. That's promo code STRANGERS for 10% off your purchase. And we're back. Holy shit. Come on, Paul. Let's talk about San Diego Comic Con and all the kinds of things that have happened. You know, I, I definitely didn't want to depress anyone before the show. I mean, I didn't mean to. Too bad, you did. Um. <laughs> no, but I mean, um, Jesus Christ. I mean, like, I literally, while well, before when we were getting ready for this episode and I was putting all my notes together, I was like, I, I wanted to make sure I got everything. And I don't think I got everything that I wanted to talk about, but I definitely have like a whole page full of shit. Um, okay. well, I, don't, I want to talk about what do you want to talk about? I've been t- I talked the first half an hour. <laughs> I know what I want to talk about. I want to talk about the fact Sting is fucking back. Technically, <laughs> I mean, even though they haven't like flat out announced it, I mean, it's pretty much said and done that Sting has signed a contract with WWE. Right. Um, I don't think they've officially announced it, but I mean, they've been teasing it. He's been talking okay, about. It. Well, here's here's what the details are right now. Basically, he has. It's basically. I guess it's called like a press contract, basically where he he's involved with the video game, the next uh, WWE video game. Um, I want to say it's 2K15, WWE 2K15 maybe. Um, that sounds about right, yeah. Yeah, so Sting's character is finally in the game, which is awesome. 
uh, they had an awesome promo for it, which everybody just, it just blew up the internet, because everybody's like, oh, Sting's back, holy shit, Sting's back, you know. Mm -hmm. um, then uh, this past weekend at San Diego Comic-Con, they announced, uh, Mattel announced that they were doing a Sting finger, and all of a sudden, here comes Sting out of nowhere. <laughs> and he does. Um, you know, he answered questions and everything. Um, the one thing that I found really interesting was is he did an interview backstage with WWE, mm -hmm. and uh, he's talking about basically, like, you know, he's getting old, and, you know, this is the time for him to actually have those matches that he, you know, that he, sh that he wants to have, you know, and he talked about how he'd like to have a match with John Cena, uh, let's see, Randy Orton, uh, The Rock, I was like, oh, yes, I want that match so bad. <laughs> um, oh, I th he said Triple H, too, which I found interesting. So, um, I think I, I think we're going to see, I'm hoping, there, there's rumors out there that they're trying to get him, because there's such this, this huge build-up, and it seems that Sting is like, yeah, let's do this, let's do this. You know, there seems to be movement in the direction of he's going to sign another contract where he's going to be wrestling. Mm. Um, well, I mean, remember that WWE bought like the entire video library of WCW and ECW and ECW. So, right. so well, I mean, they could have used all the fucking Sting footage of the past if they wanted to. You know, and and put out. You know, they could have put out all well, of his matches on DVD. You know, what I'm saying like, I mean, one thing. not that they. I don't think. I don't think he was forced into it. But I mean, you know, uh, you know, you might as well swim with the current. You know, what I'm saying like, you know, you might as well go with the flow. No, no, no. Well, I, I think. I, I think what's happening here, and it's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Mm -hmm. I think all these older wrestlers that are coming to the point where you know, hey, I need to go. I need to you know, have a good run and get out of here kind of deal, you know, and then continue to do stuff involved with wrestling, um, are coming to the, the realization that, hey, I got to go back to WWE and do this stuff. I mean, look, Hulk Hogan is back with WWE because, you know, that's where the money's at. Mm. Fuck that. Fuck TNA. What the fuck do I need to go to TNA and wrestle? The company, <laughs> I mean, not to switch gears a little bit, but side note, TNA is probably not going to have, not going to be on Spike TV next year. Or at the end of this year. So, like, you know, why would you stay with a company that's basically failing? You know what I mean? Yeah. And, you know, you also got to put on, you also got to say, the WWE is the big is the big dog in this league, you know? <laughs> you have to, if you want money, you're going to go to the big dog. You're going to go to WWE, whether it's just to be on a show on WWE Network, or it's to get extra money for being in a video game, or whatever, dude. I'm there in two seconds. Shit, mm -hmm. fuck. If I was like Mick Foley and all them, I'd be there in two seconds too. Fuck that shit. You know what I mean? So, I, I'm I'm expecting to see more. Um, I've heard rumors that Kurt Angle might be coming back. I have I've heard rumors that I, I just read something about Jeff Hardy wants to come back too um, to finish his run as well. Not finish his run, but maybe come back and actually. You know, be a part of it because he was a huge superstar, dude. Yeah, yeah. You know, he's he still, did. Really he's well. still. I mean, maybe not his prime, but he's he's closer to his prime. You know, look at look at than look he at, was at the beginning. I guess you know, what I'm saying like he's not. He's probably not at his prime, but he's right. Just just past his prime. Yeah. Well, look at look at Rob Van Dam. Like Rob Van Dam is still in the WWE. He came back because well, the money's in WWE, dude. Like these people are not stupid. You know, you're gonna see the Dunley Boys come back at some point. You're gonna see. You're gonna just see all these wrestlers that we want to see back eventually. And uh, you know what? I, I'll be the first to tell you that. I have to thank Triple H because you can you can definitely tell that Triple H. Um, I think his name in real life is Paul something. Paul John, his his real name is Jean Paul Levesque. <laughs> so really? Did I know that off really? the top of my head? Yeah. Wow. I think he he goes by Paul Levesque. I think his real like official birth certificate name is Jean Paul Levesque. Super French. <laughs> oh, I thought it was like Paul something, but okay. Um, yeah, it's, it's just really like like you can definitely tell like that Triple H is running things. Because it, it just seems like these wrestlers are more responsive to him. Like, you know, the Warrior always talked about, oh, I'm never going to come back, I'm never going to come back. And he came back, and he had an incredible Hall of Fame. He had an incredible, incredible speech on Raw. And, you know, even though the man died the next day, like, you look at that speech and you go, wow. <laughs> Yeah. You go, wow, like, that is awesome. Like, to be able to do that at his age, like, that was just incredible. And, you know, he could have been, you know, it could have been the fact that he might have been, you know, on his way out anyways, and he didn't didn't tell anybody. 
But, you know, again, it's just, it's incredible. You know what I mean? So, but getting back to Sting, you know, I'm excited. And um, I think I think Vince McMahon is kicking himself for ending Undertaker's uh, streak. But, you know, I, hey, they did what they did. And, yeah, I, I still think the match is going to be good. I still think it's going to be good. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, Sting, you know, it's he's at that point where, you know, I mean, he could he could go anywhere he wants. You know what I'm saying? Any he could go to any promotion right now, and they'd fucking you know they'd fall to their knees and just start blowing him. Okay. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, and not that not that he's gonna come to WWE and start calling the shots, but at least you know he's gonna get um, time. I mean, because you know, right. wrestling, in my opinion, goes in cycles. Every, you know, every now and then, you know, the the roller coaster goes up. You know, and it's really fucking good and really interesting. I honestly feel that right now it's kind of at a down slump. I think it's been on a down slump for like the past like two years or so. Right. You know? And that's, of course, that's just my own personal oh. opinion because because oh. you know, I'm not watching it. But uh, you know, you know, when it gets good, it gets really fucking good. And then when it gets corny, you know, and it's of course, of course, it gets corny because the stuff that's good starts getting getting driven into the fucking ground. You know what I'm saying? You know, when you know the Rock was the best, and and and, and Triple H was the best, and you know, and and things are good. But then you know, when the Rock is headlining every fucking night, you know, then it gets boring. You know, saying when Triple H is headlining every night, or the Undertaker, or you know, if you want to use the newer guys like John Cena or, or Daniel Bryan, or you know, any of these guys, you know, they take unfortunately um, they oversaturate. Uh, the you know when you got when you got a, a stable of you know 40 50 guys that are all hungry and you keep shoving the same you know four or five superstars down our throats it gets a little it gets a little you know and but of course i understand they want to sell t-shirts they want to sell you know they want to put tickets you know and they put asses in seats i mean they do pretty much sell out every arena they go to i mean it's it's you know you you, you can't deny the fucking juggernaut that wwe is um you know and but you know I, i'm i think sting coming to wwe is part of that uh, it's part of the cycle that gets good again you know what i'm saying i mean right. you know the roller coaster has dropped and it's gone down but it's it's going to get you know he's going to be part of that wave of of guys that are um you know of things getting and and real quick and i don't want to i don't want to switch, switch the subject too too much but did you hear about daniel bryan recently in his personal life what happened at the oh i heard like somebody tried to rob him and he fucking yeah a guy tried to rob his house and he put him in a fucking chokehold yeah that's uh, hilarious so i just i you know and you well know, and, and he's one of the guys being primed to be one of the next big things you know and i honestly don't like him but who knows i mean you know maybe with the next wave you know uh you know he'll start and and don't get me wrong my friends that do still watch wrestling and you know people that i follow on twitter and facebook and stuff like that i mean they swear this guy is like you know the next big big thing and maybe he you know one day he'll win me over but right now i'm i'm not i'm not i'm not into the whole daniel bryan thing but eh, one day i will i guess you know <laughs> well you know i also think that um I'm trying to think like well yeah daniel bryan that's a <laughs> It's hilarious because Daniel Bryan just like it, it's the same thing as what what uh, LL Cool J went through. That's what I was trying to say. Um, he uh, somebody broke into his house and like LL Cool J just fucked this guy up for like coming in because I think his kids <laughs> I think his kids were there too when this kid when this guy like just all of a sudden showed up out of nowhere and he just literally just lit him up and it was hilarious because it's like you don't expect you don't expect that to happen you know yeah so. Well, I mean, LL Cool J has gotten very big, like physically big, <laughs> the past like, you know, five ten years. I mean, you know, I'm I'm used to him when he was like eighteen years old, when he was like a, when he was like just starting to rap and stuff like that. He was always coming. I mean, he was in shape, you know. And I guess even back in the day of like Mama said, no, 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 he, no, no. Was, he was. But now he's he like was, a fucking monster. Yeah, he's, like, <laughs> he's like a monster, dude. Like, dude, like he could crush you with a finger. <laughs> <laughs> like, you so. chose the wrong fucking house, dude. <laughs> All right, here we go, man. Go ahead. You want to read Double it? Jackpot. What is it? It is a self-published book by Christopher Cologne. Chris Cologne? Smells good to me. But- <laughs> <laughs> Look at her. That broke that fucking cold little exterior. He's like, hee hee But it is spelled C-O-L-O-N. Him punny. But... <laughs> <laughs> Double Jackpot is a book about a comic book artist, Eric, who is in a loveless relationship with oh, a materialistic I feel you, Eric. Lynette. I, 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 oh, fucking. Are you oh, sure God. I didn't write this? 
Uh, I, I smell sounds hauntingly familiar. He starts cheating on his girlfriend with a more creatively, su- sorry, creatively supportive woman, Nadia. Well, I, I gotta meet her. Where's the Nadia? There's your summer girlfriend. Summer Nadia is Nadia. Nadia? Yeah, I think Nadia spelled with an A. All right. Both Lynette and uh, Nadia play the double jackpot, the largest payout in Lotto history, much like the recent Powerball. Both girls play his birth date as the winning re- as the winning numbers. Eric is now stuck between two of the country's richest women. Who will he choose? It's not that simple. This is a clever fucking idea, yeah, man. Is. Look at her, fucking. She's impressed. I am. Summer. She got some summer reading. Uh, Christopher uh, Cologne smells real lovely with an original idea. Is this? I've never heard this before. I haven't either. This is a self-published book, much in the indie spirit as Kev's Clerks. Oh, you don't even need to name check me. This is just a good idea. You could stand on your own, man. You don't even have to be like, hey, remember Clerks? This is nothing like that. <laughs> this is way more original than Clerks. This is a good idea, man. Why didn't I think of this? I need something to read. This book is part of the Comic Books Heavy Metal Video Games Trilogy Book 2. Odd I See, A Tale from the Road, coming soon. Right on, man. It's part of a trilogy. This is the first part. Way to write, man. He's seeking a literary agent. Motherfuckers, anybody out there? There ain't no literary agents listening to this show, I assure you, sure. Sure. I assure you, sure. But somebody know a literary agent? Hook a motherfucker up! Chris Cologne come up with an original idea. I should tell Raskin. That's a good fucking idea, to be so honest too. with you. That's a fucking rom-com right there. Megan, get Raskin on the phone. <laughs> Isn't it possible to get Raskin on the phone? No? Yeah. I want to run it past him, man. I want to, and if it happens, I get a taste, Chris Cologne. I get a, a whiff, if you will. The book could also be ordered on www.lulu.com. That's lulu.com. That's, com. I understand that. I just want to spell it out. <laughs> <laughs> Normally one says it, that spells it. Still, lulu.com. What is that? Do you know what it is? I don't know. All right. The book could also be ordered on www.lulu.com. Search for Double Jackpot Christopher Cologne. A paperback version of the book is $15, and a PDF file is only 5 bucks. Five dollars is yeah. insanely inexpensive. Fifteen's not even that bad for a hard, for a paperback version. No. This is a million dollar idea right here. Like a, a fucking a movie about a dude who fucking is stuck between two chicks, both of who play his birthday and win the lottery. Come on! Come I, like on. I can see that trailer. Chris Cologne is on to something. Nobody else can smell it but me. I'll read it. Thank you. I'm going to make that smelly joke. I all. know. You're trying to get me to laugh again. It worked once. <laughs> Double Jackpot is a self-published book by Chris Cologne, man. It's the first book in his comic books, heavy metal, video games trilogy. Book two, Odd I See, A Tale from the Road, should be coming out soon. Get all the information. Chris Cologne, like a motherfucker, I will and his totally book, read this. Double Jackpot. I'm serious. I'm going to recommend that to fucking Raskin. That's, how is that not a movie? You know what I'm saying? This could be a sexy movie. You could do an R-rated version. There could be nudie in it. You could sell them fucking both chicks. Maybe a little penetration. Maybe a butthole shot. No butthole, no care. I would like to formally apologize to Christopher Cologne. Right no, now, sex but... sells. Chris Cologne will appreciate that. He's like, thanks for throwing a few buttholes in there, man. Don't forget to check out two strangers one podcast.net, your one stop resource for everything show related. You can find links to subscribe to us on iTunes or on Stitcher. You could also find links to buy my book, Double Jackpot, on two strangers one podcast.net. Fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, you're cool, and fuck you, I'm out.